Yeah, the military in Hawaii, looking back on a sterling military career uh, with Robert Lee, Etchison General, Major General of the state of Hawaii. Um, wonderful to have him on the show. Uh, thank you for coming down, Bob. Thank you, Jay. My pleasure. So let's uh, let's talk about what you've been doing since you retired a couple of years ago. Uh, and then let's talk about your, you know, perspective. <laughs> uh, your perspective is really sure. important. And I, and I would like to add one thought there is that, you know, retired seniors have a special perspective, not only about the military, but about the world in general. And it, we really need to keep in touch with them um, to examine that perspective. It's very, very helpful to us. So tell us about what you've been doing since you retired. Bob. Well, thank, thank you, Jay. Well, first off, as soon as I retired, uh, General Shinseki, former chief of staff of the United States Army, and at that time, Secretary of Veterans Affairs, called me in and says, Bob, you're going to have some time on your hands. You need to do this. And this was uh, to award the Congressional Gold Medal to the Nisei soldiers of the famed 100th Battalion, 442nd Infantry Regiment, and the Military Intelligence Service. And the 442nd being my former unit in the Army, how could I tell him no? Besides, there's this communications dialogue between a four-star and a two-star. It kind of goes one way from the <laughs> four-star to the two. So uh, we honored uh, the Japanese-American Nisei soldiers of, uh, of World War II and for what they did, their exploits, uh, not only in combat, uh, in the field, but uh, how they changed society in Hawaii and the United States from uh, internment camps to being part of uh, mainstream America. So that was a very enjoyable experience. And unbeknownst to me, that there was an effort uh, in about 2017 to kind of award the Congressional Gold Medal to Chinese American World War II veterans. And at first I thought, hmm, you know, uh, they were the only minorities that did not serve in segregated units. They must be okay. <laughs> and uh, not knowing my history, shame on me, that uh, like a lot of minorities in America during World War II, they had to fight to join in order to fight. So there was an additional hurdle. Uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, targeted a racial group for the first time in America's history. So at the outbreak of World War II, Chinese Americans uh, couldn't vote, couldn't own property. And in fact, 40% of the Chinese Americans in America were not even citizens. But they said, this is our country and uh, we're gonna defend America. So they signed up in, in World War II. So out of the eligible population, 20,000 uh, served in World War II, uh, roughly uh, one in five at about a 20% mark. Now, a lot of Americans served in World War II, and we really needed all 16 million Americans at that time to defeat Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. But uh, that 16 million, um, comprise roughly 7% of America's population. So the Chinese uh, served at the three times the, the, the ratio at, uh, and uh, they could serve in any unit they, they chose. Uh, most of them joined the United States Army and at that time, part of the Army, the United States Army Air Forces, Army Air Corps. And then the rest, the, then you found Chinese Americans in the, in the Marines, the Navy, the Coast Guard, and uh, mer Merchant Marine. So uh, they got to serve everywhere, fought on uh, land, sea, and air, and served in every uh, theater of operations. Quite uh, a feat that uh, it was a story that we had to tell. Yeah, there's a lot of stories from World War II that we really haven't yet mm -hmm. examined, that we haven't told. We're still learning about World War II, and that, that is one of those stories, the Chinese Americans and the in the military at that time. That's an important story. Well, last, Jay, go ahead. Last week, uh, we had a show on Westlock and the, and the second Pearl Harbor, they called it, right. 1944. That was also a story. I don't mm -hmm. think a lot of people know about that. Right. And um, But I think uh, what I found in common with uh, the Nisei getting their Congressional Gold Medal and the Chinese Americans receiving their Congressional Gold Medal, because that generation never tooted their horn. They, they felt they just did their duty. And um, um, people have asked me, why did it take so long to recognize this generation? 
Well, that's because if we had done this 25, 30 years earlier, the living veterans would have told us, knock it off. We don't need, we don't need this. It wasn't until the majority of the, the veterans have passed and the family member says, yeah, I, I think my, uh, my dad or my grandpa would, would, would like this uh, recognition from the Congress of the United States, one yeah. of the, the highest uh, award that can be bestowed by America on a, on a group of Americans for what they did. So glad that happened. So glad you organized it. But, but you know, it's interesting. You don't, you don't hear that much uh, about uh, Chinese senior officers. I mean, American Chinese senior officers. And, right. and now there's a certain amount of, um, you know, press coverage of Susie Lum as the new president uh -huh. of the East-West Center. Uh, mm -hmm. what, is that, what, is, what does that mean? What does it signify for you, Bob? Wow, great. Um, the, Susie Barris Lum, when I knew her, as a rising star in the Hawaii Army National Guard. Uh, when I first met her was Lieutenant Colonel Susie Varislam. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, uh, one of my first duties was to send her to Iraq with the rest of the 29th Brigade. <laughs> and they, uh, she and the rest of the soldiers of the 29th uh, did very well in the 2004 uh, deployment. And we uh, kept, uh, kept I kept watch on uh, Susie. Uh, gave her a lot of assignments, and uh, each one that she she did well. But I think she really flourished when we assigned her to PACOM, and and then now Indo PACOM, where mixed with all the other services, uh, she really shown uh, her her talents. And I'm glad the board of the East West Center recognized uh, that talent. Excellent choice in selecting her as the president of the East West Center. That, that's great. That's great for the East West Center. It's great for Hawaii. It's great. It's great for Chinese uh, senior officers, and I really appreciate that. So let's let's talk about what you've been, um, you know, doing in terms of uh, consulting, because I think, as I said before, the perspective of a senior officer is unique. Uh, you learn things, you see things, you examine the world with a with a perspective that's special, and and that is something that we should. That we should recognize and and, um, and 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 give you opportunities to express. So my question is, uh, you know, what are you doing in terms of consulting now as a retired uh, adjutant general, major well, general? Well, Jay, I'd like to kind of maybe go backwards in time a little bit, where a lot of members of your audience are, you know, they're they're aware of what the National Guard does in in our state and in every state that. Um, you know, uh, you, you have a problem and you call out the guard, whether it's a domestic disaster or a, a quick one brewing. Uh, but anyone that uh, you, when you need immediate action, you need to do that. But I wanted to cover uh, another aspect of the guard that's a bit un unknown and uh, uh, not widely uh, known to the public is that uh, the guard marries up with countries across the world and work uh, hand in hand to, uh, uh, to improve their uh, military operations and er even uh, uh, civilian operations. And we call that uh, in, in the National Guard, the State Partnership Program. And in Hawaii, for many years, uh, we partnered with the Philippines, and uh, during my tenure, what a, a big surprise when Admiral Keating called me up and says, uh, um, Indonesia has selected Hawaii as a state partner. I said, oh, my goodness. You know, we were about 1.2 million then and the largest democratic Muslim country in the world, with about 250 million. Uh, we might get overwhelmed. But no, it's, it's, it's OK. So we started really not with military engagements was more with emergency management. They had just gone through a horrific, a horrific uh, Aceh earthquake and tsunami. You know, Americans can't fathom in a, in a natural disaster losing 250,000 citizens. And so uh, with the uh, Hawaii Tsunami Warning Center, installed multiple uh, tsunami warning devices throughout the archipelago of Indonesia uh, to provide them uh, future uh, advanced warning of earthquakes and tsunamis. Because what happened back in the, you know, 2004, I believe, uh, 
it's going to happen happen again. And then we ramped up the number, uh, thanks to Senator Inouye then, installation of uh, many uh, tsunami warning buoys uh, throughout the Pacific, throughout the, the rim, rim of fire. So we, that engagement was really um, uh, firsthand. And I remember Dr. Chip McQuarrie, who headed the Pacific Tsunami Center, and uh, Governor Lingo at that time went to sign the state partnership agreement with uh, Minister of Defense Sudar Sono. And she was uh, amazed to find Dr. Chip McQuarrie even more popular than the governor of Hawaii. He was the rock star. He was installing all these tsunami early warning systems uh, uh, throughout the Indonesian archi archipelago. But then we quickly engaged into the military side of things on how to um, uh, Im improve Indonesia's military capability. And uh, so we prepped the Indonesian Armed Forces for United Nations peacekeeping operations. And to this day, Indonesia has only one peacekeeping mission. Their, their forces, two battalions worth, are between Lebanon and Israel in the border area. Interesting. And I tell friends, it says, you know, it's so much easier to have a, or better to have a competent Muslim force that you can count on keeping the peace, being neutral, than to try to have Americans or, you know, a NATO unit trying to enforce the peace between Le Lebanon and Israel. So that's really a good example that I would like to segue and give kudos to my friends, uh, the former adjutant generals for the state of California, because California led the training of the Ukrainian Territorial Reserve Forces. And my friends tell me that in 2014, when Russia invaded and took Crimea and parts of uh, the Donbass area by force, uh, Ukraine was caught flat-footed. I mean, the military wasn't prepared, but they said, Putin's going to come back for more. We just don't know when. So let's get serious about defending our country. And of course, NATO laughed and the United States laughed. Oh, no, I mean, that, that's not, that's not going to happen. But the Ukrainian military took it upon themselves to improve their operations, did a lot of exercises with NATO, and the California National Guard started to ramp up the Ukrainian territorial defense forces that served in, in their area of assignment. They weren't going to jump all over Ukraine, but you know they knew the territory for their towns. They knew how to set up ambushes for the Russians, and they knew how to shoot javelins and anti-tank missile. This is a reserve force. So I, I bet the yes men of the generals that told uh, President Putin, you know, what he wanted to hear, that uh, they thought invading Ukraine in 2022, they would run into the same military, Ukrainian military force. But now you have another 100,000 plus very well-trained reserve forces. And glad to see that they're taking it uh, to, to the Russians. So it's this uh, National Guard partnership that we have with probably over 50 countries throughout the world right now, that uh, in addition to um, uh, the, the disaster response, uh, we're, we're certainly uh, building uh, the capability of uh, many uh, democratic uh, countries so that uh, they get more bang for the buck from their own armed forces. Yeah, it, it really is very important. And I, you're right, we don't know about it. And it's fascinating to hear you describe it. I mean, a lot of our shows are fascinating, but Bob, this is really fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the difference between the contribution made overseas, you know, in these various countries and hotspots um, between, you know, the regular army, regular United States military and the National Guard? Well, how, how do they come at it from different ways? <clears throat> okay, I, I think... Uh... I'd like to give an example. Uh, when I, Governor Lingo and I first went to Jakarta to sign up on the, the, um, the state partnership between the state of Hawaii and the country of Indonesia. And I remember saying this to uh, Defense Minister Sudar Sono because the chairman of the Joint Chief, General Peter Pace, was visiting Indonesia in Jakarta and they were riding in the streets. And I told the defense minister, 
So the Sona said, you know, I don't think this is such a good idea. <laughs> Maybe this is a little too early that your country may not be ready for Americans. He said, no, that's, that's not true. We need to sign this and do this now. You know, Hawaii, you guys are different. Everybody loves Hawaii. And so the National Guard comes in really at a non-threatening level. They know we do a lot of emergency response. Uh, and, and that's normally uh, the inroads in there, how, how they would, we would work with them to re improve their emergency response system. And for example, we change, I mean, not we per se, but working with the Indonesian government on all their natural disasters, uh, everybody looked to Jakarta, the capital. What are we going to do? And they said, we got to change this. We're the, we're the bottleneck. So they started to make the provinces and the provincial governors responsible to, take, to be the first responders and to uh, take care of the disasters within their uh, provinces. Well, wasn't that uh, a spotlight, you know? And we, we wanted them to come to their con this conclusion instead of sort of telling them what to do. So they finally realized that being decentralized, yes, Jakarta will help you, just like Washington, D.C., when you get a little overwhelmed and you need FEMA money and other assistance will we'll come and help. But the governor and the mayor, you're, you're first up. You need to take care of the emergency, and the guard will be there to, to help you be successful. This reminds me of comments that Barack Obama made um, <laughs> to explain um, you know, his worldview, that it was different because he was from Hawaii, and Hawaii <laughs> is a different worldview. Yes. And, and I, that's what I get from your discussion. Hawaii is a different worldview. It's a different perspective. <clears throat> and, you know, in terms of your experience, the National Guard experience, uh, we see things. We in Hawaii have a special advantage mm -hmm. socially and, and um, you know, geopolitically uh, and politically in the United States. Uh, the regular uh, U.S. military deals with um, the chain of command out of Washington. Um, the National Guard deals with the chain of command out of Washington but also the states. So yeah. you can put those two perspectives together. Tell me, tell me if I'm right. You are absolutely correct, Jay. And I think um, I, I wanted to uh, just give another example because uh, I think we're seeing in Europe how well uh, NATO has come together finally <laughs> and growing and being a unified uh, perspective. But uh, why not Asia? That how come there's no such thing as a NATO and from my experience, uh, the countries, you know, they kind of don't trust their neighbors, but they'll gladly make a deal one on one with the United States. So you have all these individual countries uh, making a bilateral deal within the United States. But um, when we had Homeland Security meetings, because I'll tell you, top of mind, when I first got appointed was really terrorism. And the last thing I wanted was a bomb going off in the Alamona shopping center and knocking off all the tourism. So I was watching the uh, Islamic uh, uh, radical groups taking hold in Indonesia and the Philippines and how it was slowly <laughs> moving, uh, moving from uh, east, uh, west, west to east. And that was my, my concern. And one of the reasons for holding the, the Homeland Security conferences was to invite Malaysia, Brunei, and all these Asian countries were put in a room, you know, they're no longer, they're kind of in neutral turf. So they were exchanging prisoners, uh, pictures of uh, the Islamic terrorists, how they moved from Jakarta to Malaysia, to, uh, to Thailand, and they're all exchanging information that, uh, uh, and, uh, and having a good uh, dossier on, on how they behave and sharing that type of information at, at, at that time. So uh, we, we talked about the rotating this security conference throughout the, the, the Pacific, just to give other nations a chance. And I was summarily voted down. I said, nope, we're gonna come to Hawaii all the time because we can get access to Indo-PACOM and all the services. And, and Hawaii has a good atmosphere for sharing some information that we would not share with our neighbor directly uh, in, in the theater. So I thought that was a bit interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, it's the whole notion that Dan and Owe set up at APCSS, isn't it? Yep. Mm -hmm. Making us a, a kind of hub for right. security around the Pacific. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Well, you know, um, uh, I'd like to have a hypothetical with you, uh, Bob. Okay. Uh, I'd like to give you, a, you know, like here on a given Tuesday afternoon, I'd like to give you $40 billion. Okay. <laughs> uh -huh. I, I really like you a lot, and I'd like to give you $40 Well, billion. you're nice. You're nice. <laughs> 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 and I'd like to tell you, why don't you know? Why don't you spend about half of that on humanitarian and half of that on military uh, in Ukraine? So the question is, you know, how does that change the narrative right now? How does that change the way things are working? And how would you spend my special gift to you, Bob? Okay. First of all, um, I think things are going well in Ukraine with the new systems coming in. Uh, Russia cannot. Uh, technically uh, rebuild their tanks and their cruise missiles. By the way, you, I hope the public realizes that, yeah, uh, Ukraine is taking some hits from the Russian cruise missiles, but really over 50% of them don't reach the target. And if they do, they, you know, they don't cause a hit. So what I'd like to do is take your generous money and I would like to gift to Taiwan two things, mm. okay? First thing I would do is uh, uh, with Taiwan Semiconductor, business to business, uh, fund them so that uh, Starlink is over Taiwan, all right? Not only over the island of Taiwan, but I would like Starlink to expand out to 100 nautical miles to reach the Chinese coast, all right? Then the other part of your money, I would like to purchase the Iron Dome system Mm -hmm. for Taipei and other key installations. I think those two areas and not necessarily US military solutions, but that will make Xi Jinping think twice about trying to forcibly take Taiwan. Well, I mean, you, you suggest uh, that the um, United States has not spent the money before, not as much. We have, we have great military. We mm -hmm. spent plenty of money in the military, but we have to spend the money on being a presence, uh, not only in Europe, perhaps more than we have been, but in Asia, perhaps more than we have been, you know, by expanding the quad, you know, and firming up the quad. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to be a presence. Now, there are those people in the country who don't feel we should do that, uh, who feel we should be more nationalistic and isolationistic. But, you know, in protecting the liberal world order, seems to me one of the lessons here of the past few years is that we really have to be the world's policemen and we have to hold we have to be the city on the hill the beacon on the hill and we have to maintain our moral liberal order uh, in order to preserve the world liberal order what do you think i think one one more thing is uh, like it or not america has to be the leader because the world will will follow us because we're doing this for an ideal that will make them okay, you know, uh, further their freedom and, and democracy. We're not looking to take it away from them. So every time I hear that America wants to lead from behind <laughs> and not to, not to step up, it really bothers me because we're, we're, we have been afforded the driver's seat based on our actions on all the previous years, our sacrifices, and, and that's how we can, we can help the world. Uh, so we need to step up in, in that manner. Yeah, it, it, it kind of takes us back to the early part of the discussion here today about the, the medals, about the congressional medals um, for the uh, you know, Japanese soldiers in World War II, and the, for that matter, the Chinese soldiers in World War II, and the contributions. You know, it's like when you look forward, you have to remember the sacrifices that people made in American history. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can't throw those away. Uh, they, they define us and they obligate us too to continue, mm -hmm. to continue what we were doing. Um, these people gave their lives, many of them, mm -hmm. for a reason. I mean, is that your thinking? Yes. And uh, I like to bring up one point with this national award. Um, for the Nisei soldiers and for the World War II Chinese American veterans, but bring it closer to home because I reviewed thousands of records, um, pictures and uh, discharge records to make sure that these veterans 
and their surviving families uh, were due the Congressional Gold Medal. And, uh, you know, the Chinese Americans, uh, that's how it was back then. A lot of them were cooks in the, in the military or ran laundries, but uh, it was different from Hawaii. So what stood out was the top army soldier, Captain Francis Y, Punahou grad, Honolulu, Hawaii, uh, gave his life in the liberation of the Philippines when MacArthur landed again at Leyte Gulf. And uh, he uh, received the Congressional Medal of Honor for his heroic actions. And then you have Admiral Gordon Chun Hoon, USS Sigsby, Battle of Okinawa, hit by a kamikaze, Commander Chun Hoon at that time. And he survived, saved the ship, and went on to become a rear admiral in the United States Navy, also from Hawaii. And then finally in the Army Air Force, we have Captain George Lee, a distant cousin, I believe. Yeah, right. Wow. Recently, recently found out that he was a fighter pilot in the Flying Tigers in China, shot down three Japanese planes. Now the Mitsubishi Zero was a superior fighter than our old P-40 Warhawk. So he was, must have been one hell of a fighter pilot to shoot down uh, three, three Japanese, and uh, also from Honolulu, Hawaii. So you have the top Army guy, top Navy guy, and Army Air Force, Army Air Corps guy. It must be in the water we have here, I guess, huh, Jay? <laughs> <laughs> I, I always say that. It must be the water. Yeah. So looking, looking at what we've talked about here today, Bob, um, you know, the, the legacy, the tradition, uh, of the National Guard, of, of um, our Asian, um, you know, soldiers over uh, over a long, long period of time and mm -hmm. multiple wars, actually. Um, what's your advice to people in Hawaii about how they should see the military, how they should see the National Guard, how they should see service, how they should see the role of the state and the National Guard in the state vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, events in the world today? <laughs> Well, first of all, um, I think the people of Hawaii, we, we enjoy a tremendous support from the community for uh, the members serving in the, in the military and, and especially in, in the National Guard. Uh, so we, we appreciate all that support. But, you know, we have to work on this for every generation. They, especially if there's not a shooting war or anything like that, it's, uh, hmm, what do we need you for why do we need to spend spend all this money but it's all about uh, preparedness because if you prepare for war you're really able to handle uh, the, you know other other emergencies in a in an organized and well manner and i just like to say like during covid when the national guard was called to uh, to step in i for one uh, saw some state agencies very dysfunctional and they couldn't they couldn't handle day-to-day -day, uh, uh, functions to support the people of Hawaii. And the, so the National Guard came in, helped organize it, got contact tracing, vaccination, whatever. And on the mainland, oh, you're short of teachers? Well, we'll go do that too. And guarding borders, thank goodness that we have a big, big ocean. But uh, that's just to, as you, uh, you know, for an Army guy using a naval term, just to write the ship so that then the the organizations can now then then take over and uh, and and to 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 serve the public. So uh, for the young people, you know, consider joining the National Guard. Um, and I uh, I tell them if you have a six year enlistment, uh, we have so many good benefits. If it, if you don't get a college degree at the end of your six year enlistment, shame on you. <laughs> ah. Thank you so much, Bob. Uh, Robert Lee, um, is Adjutant General of the State of Hawaii, Major General of the State of Hawaii, um, uh, with long, long career of service. And, and I, I say this to a lot of people, but I want to say it especially to you. Bob, thank you for your service to the state and to the nation. Mahalo, Jay. Pleasure being on your show. Take Aloha. care. Talk soon. Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.